Hello everyone. Uh, we will talk about electronics on the brain. I try to uh, put a little bit um, of um, interesting uh, stuff for everyone, um, for those of you who are uh, engineers, for those of you who are life scientists, for those of you who are just interested in uh, technology and its impact on, on healthcare. Um, the motivation for this work uh, stems from the fact that the leading cause of disability worldwide is neurological disorders. Um, in a study that uh, was commissioned a couple of years ago, it was found that over 270 million disability adjusted life years, DALIs as uh, they're called in medical language, um, were lost to uh, neurological disorders. Stroke leading the way, but migraines, uh, dementias, epilepsy, uh, spinal cord injuries, and so on and so forth contribute to this uh, tremendous loss of uh, productivity. And unfortunately, the trend is that um, this is increasing and neurological disorders taking a, 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 a higher toll every year um, that goes by. Now, the news from the pharmaceutical industry is um, not good. Um, drug discovery is becoming slower and more expensive in time. This is a plot that shows um, the number of drugs that is developed per billion US dollars. And of course, it has been normalized for, um, for, for time. And it's now below one. So it costs a lot of money to come up with new drugs. And this slows down uh, uh, development. Uh, this trend is called Irum's law, um, which is Moore's law spelled backwards. Uh, Moore's law is what describes the development of electronic devices, which has been accelerating as a function of time. Um, the trend I'm showing here is the opposite. It, it's uh, a drug discovery slowing down. So um, this is bad news for neuro neurological disorders, but the good news comes from a field called bioelectronic medicine, which uses electronics to trigger um, phenomena in the uh, nervous system. And this has been used for therapeutic, uh, 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 for, for delivering therapy. In the case of, um, for example, shown here of uh, dystonia, um, as well as other uh, uh, diseases of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the nervous system. Um, in this case, electrodes are used uh, and placed deep in the brain in a structure called the subthalamic nucleus and stimulate electrically by means of electrical pulses. And as a result, um, disorders such as the ones listed here can be addressed to quite a large degree. So here, with a flick of a switch, the tremor uh, that this patient has disappears and he can gain quite a high degree of coordination. Um, so, recently, this have also been used for um, uh, neuro, uh, in addition to neurological disorders for uh, conditions such as uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, as well as uh, obesity. And um, there are lots of research labs around the world that are trying to extend the gamut of conditions um, that this technology can address. Um, implantable stimulators have been used for quite a while in the clinic, starting from work in the late 50s, uh, early 60s on cardiac uh, pacemakers for uh, arrhythmias. Today, this is a fairly standard um, procedure that takes place worldwide to the tune of about 600,000 patients per, per year would benefit from this technology. Then um, a decade later, um, cochlear implants for restoring hearing uh, were developed. Again, a fairly uh, standard technology today. Then spinal cord stimulators for pain, vagus nerve stimulation for uh, treating epilepsy, sacral nerve stimulation for bladder control, uh, deep brain for Parkinson's, obsessive compulsive disorder, and then prosthesis in the, um, uh, in the eye, um, and other um, nerves, 
And uh, this is not an exhaustive list. The trend has been accelerating and there are more and more of these devices that are being approved for um, clinical use. And it has created such a splash that even companies that we wouldn't associate with bioelectronics are now jumping into the game. A couple of years ago, there was a, a, a consortium that was uh, formed between the parent company of Google and GlaxoSmithKline. They formed uh, Galvani Bioelectronics to treat disease rather than with uh, pharmaceuticals, with electrical stimulators. And then the founder of uh, Tesla and SpaceX, Elon Musk, got into the game, founder of Facebook. So this raises uh, expectations to a very high level and hopefully uh, all this additional interest will be a, a good thing for the field. However, there are some formidable limitations. First and foremost, we do not understand how the brain works. The brain is a very complex machine consisting of over 80 billion neurons that are connected with each other and form complex networks. And although we understand how these neurons communicate with each other, how a, a, a neuron gets excited, that fires what is called an action potential that travels down its axon and either stimulates or uh, inhibits behavior in the postsynaptic neuron. This is something that we understand reasonably well. However, we do not understand how we go from uh, this phenomena at the level of a neuron to behavior at the level of an organism. Moreover, we do not understand the mechanism of neuromodulation what happens when you now implant an electrode in the brain and apply an electrical stimulus? What happens to uh, the, uh, the communication between uh, neurons? So this is addressed by uh, trying to learn more uh, about the brain by using electrodes in a variety of configurations um, uh, shown here. Um, you can use electrodes that are placed on the scalp. This is called electroencephalography. You can use electrodes that are placed on the uh, surface of the brain, on the cortex. This is called electrocorticography. Or you can penetrate the brain with um, uh, implantable electrodes. And this is called stereotaxic electroencephalography. And all these are used uh, in the clinic for a variety of uh, applications. Now, there are trade-offs, as um, you might imagine. This is non-invasive. Um, you just place an electrode on the skin, but its spatial resolution is fairly poor because it's far away from the, um, uh, the brain. This one um, here, you can have the ultimate spatial resolution by penetrating the brain with micro electrodes that can sit right next to um, the neurons that uh, do information processing. You can get specificity down to a single neuron, but obviously this is highly invasive. Corticography lies between the two techniques. Um, it is less invasive than stereotaxic electroencephalography because you do not penetrate the brain. But at the same time, it was thought that it cannot record single neuron activities. Uh, because the signals that emanate to the surface of the brain are fairly weak. Now, these electrodes that are used to uh, study the brain and are used to excite the brain in the clinic suffer from quite a lot of limitations. The signals are very weak and they're hard to uh, capture and extract from the noise. The environment is hostile to electronics. Uh, ponder this. If we place a piece of silicon in the brain, silicon being the, um, the most celebrated semiconductor, um, it will etch uh, through a process of hydrolysis and uh, uh, oxidation and hydrolysis um, to a, the tune of about a micron a month. So it will be chewed up uh, and corroded by, by the brain. Moreover, the placement of electronics in the brain is highly invasive both to the brain and to the electronics and often requires multiple surgeries um, to uh, find the optimal position or um, uh, replace corroded leads and exhausted batteries. And 
these limitations, these technological limitations go hand in hand with uh, our ability to understand the brain. So by improving on technologies, we hope to be able to enable a better understanding of the brain and enable better bioelectronic medicines. So what I wanted to bring to your attention today are three points. The first one is that we need to teach electronics a foreign language uh, in order to more effectively communicate with neurons. So I will show you that by using materials that are called mixed conductors, um, we can enable a much better communication, much better interface between the brain and electronics. The second is um, there are new ways being developed to get drugs into the brain. The brain is protected being such a precious organ, protected by the so-called blood brain barrier that blocks out about 98% of all drugs that have been, uh, uh, that have been uh, developed. So I'll show you how with uh, implantable devices, you can overcome this limitation. And then show you some very recent work where we make implants that change shape. And uh, we hope that this will decrease the invasiveness of neurosurgery. So another way to frame the discussion in bioelectronics is to consider properties at the two different worlds that we're trying to interface. In the living world, and in particular in the brain, we deal with materials that are mostly soft, while electronics in their traditional form are made out of mechanically stiff materials. The communication between uh, components here in biological systems is very complex, whether these are cells or tissues or organs, when they communicate with each other, they exchange very complex signals that range from small metal ions, sodium, potassium, all the way to components of cells, like vesicles being exchanged from one cell to the other. Um, while here, the communication between these two components is um, very simple to describe in a quantitative fashion. It takes place by exchanging an electron flux. Biological systems are dynamic, they change shape, they evolve as a function of time. Electronics are static, they spend their lifetime in the form factor in which they were fabricated. So in the last decade or so, there has been tremendous advances in bridging the mechanical properties mismatch. And today we have electronics that have mechanical uh, properties that are very similar to those of brain. They can be made uh, soft, stretchable, and flexible, so they can sit on the surface of the brain without causing any mechanical loading. And this has been achieved by either working on new materials or by making electronics very thin so that they become uh, flexible. So the mechanical properties mismatch has been addressed to quite a reasonable uh, uh, point. Today, a lot of the action in, in uh, this research field is on bridging the communications gap. What we need to do is to be able to have information from biology flow into electronic devices in order to do diagnosis. And in the opposite direction, we want to be able to trigger phenomena in the biological world through electronic input in order to deliver treatment. And um, this communication gap um, is what I will talk about today. Um, and I will frame this in the context of epilepsy. So epilepsy is a condition that affects about 1% of the, the world. They will experience uh, repeated seizures. And about 30% of uh, epileptics are drug resistant for reasons that are not understood. When epilepsy is severe and drug resistant, then resection surgery becomes the next uh, line of treatment where the part of the brain that gives rise to epileptic seizures is localized and then removed by surgical resection. In order to do this localization, electrodes are implanted into the brain at different locations and are recording the electrical activity. And the, the, the purpose of this exercise is to find the area in the brain that gives rise to this abnormal uh, high uh, intensity activity 
that then later manifests itself as a, as a seizure. Um, and you can capture this on, on a video. Um, so the uh, key challenges here is to improve the performance of, uh, of this electrode so you can pick up the pre-ictal activity with as high uh, a resolution as possible. And to make these recordings in a less invasive fashion, can we explore the brain without uh, uh, penetrating it with electrodes? If you are a materials person, you will uh, think of this as an exercise in um, communication between ionic uh, charge carriers in an electrolyte. So these would be sodium and potassium ions that are the signals that neurons uh, use to fire action potentials in the cerebrospinal fluid and electrodes or holes in a semiconductor uh, material. So you want to have these carriers interact as much as possible, as strongly as possible, in order to transduce phenomena in the biological world. For example, if this ion is set to motion, you want it to couple with an electronic charge inside your uh, transducer so that you can then, by looking at the motion of this electronic charge, you can tell that this ion has moved and infer that a neuron has fired. If you try to do this coupling with, uh, by using silicon, you find that there is this, an oxide or a nitride at the interface that protects silicon, but serves to space away the two carriers from each other. And as a result, it decreases their interaction. So the coupling between ionics and electronics is very poor in this case. In uh, materials where you can remove that oxide, for example, if you use platinum, gold, or another noble uh, metal electrode, you're going to arrive in a situation where you have ionic charge on one side of the interface and electronic on the other. And their coupling takes place in a long an interface as indicated here. This gives you fairly limited communication between the two uh, worlds, the worlds of ionics or biology and the world of electronics. And this is described by the so-called capacitance per uh, the double layer capacitance, which is of the order of one to 10 microfarad per uh, square centimeter. Now, there are materials such as the one indicated here. We're not going to go into chemical structures uh, for this talk. Just consider this as a gooey semiconductor, like a plate of spaghetti, where ions can penetrate into the volume and couple with electronic carriers throughout the volume of the semiconductor. So in this case, rather than having a weak interaction across the interface, you have a much broader, much stronger interaction throughout the volume of the film. And that allows you to make state-of-the-art devices, devices where the coupling between electronics and ionics is very strong, as well as novel devices that do not have a, a, an analog in the world of hard inorganic semiconductors. Um, for example, you can time reverse this process and use a, a, a material such as the one indicated here to send ions to the electrolyte and as such trigger biological phenomena by delivering, for example, um, drugs. Now, I promised um, no uh, chemical details. This is the last chemical structures uh, uh, that you will see. Um, these are very similar materials. Um, they have only a minor modification in their structure. There are some oxygens here on this backbone that are absent here. And this makes a world of difference in their performance in bioelectronics. For example, this material here cannot be penetrated by ions because it has a hydrophobic character endowed by the side chain. And as a result, it has the same capacitance as a flat film of gold. On the other hand, by just doing this minor chemical modification here, we're able to increase capacitance by over an order of magnitude shown here, because now ions 
feel happy in this structure, which is uh, hydrophilic, and they can couple in a volumetric fashion with electronic ions. And this is a subject of ongoing research. We're trying to develop a language, not only understand how to, uh, uh, to develop better materials, but also how to describe the properties of these materials by using semiconductor language. So we'll leave it at that and, and go back to a material which is called P.PSS, which acts as a, an ideal volumetric capacitor. So in this material, um, its capacitance scales with the volume of the film, which means that the thicker you make the film, the higher the coupling between electronics and ionics. Just to um, uh, throw some numbers here and, and uh, uh, create a calibration point, if you have a film of this material that is only 130 nanometers thick, you will have a capacitance per unit area that will be equivalent to, that will be two orders of magnitude higher than what you would get with a gold electrode of the same area. That means that now you have two orders of magnitude stronger coupling between ionics and electronics, which also means that you can now make your electrodes two orders of magnitude smaller, 100 times smaller, and still be able to record with the same signal to noise ratio. So by just adding a thin film of a, a, a conducting polymer, on your electrode, you are able to increase the coupling, the communication between the two worlds and gain in spatial resolution. This is shown here. We've made electrodes that have this coating. Um, and these are micro electrodes that have the same size as uh, a neuron uh, of the order of uh, tens of microns. Now, without this coating, a gold electrode would not be able to capture the weak neural signals. You would need to make it much larger and it will lose tremendously in spatial resolution. But with this coating, you can make it smaller and now you can capture uh, very fine signals from the surface of the brain. These have been integrated in very thin and flexible uh, plastic membranes, so thin that they conform very nicely to topographies such as the, the ones on the brain here, they're shown on, a, uh, on the surface of uh, the leaf of an orchid. And the radii of curvature are compatible with um, the topography of the brain, uh, including being able to get into sulci. Um, so when these were placed on the uh, uh, cortex of a rat, we were able to record these blips here that correspond to the firing of single neurons. And for the first time, we were able to record single neuronal signatures without penetrating the brain. Now, this has overwhelming advantages because you can now sit at the surface of the brain without disturbing the neighborhood of, of uh, neurons and still be able to record them. And as such, it was translated to the clinic. So now this is used in uh, over uh, 20 hospitals in the US to record from uh, the human brain at very high resolution. You get global activities that are called local field potentials that you would get with larger, traditionally larger electrodes, but you also get these little spikes here that correspond to the chatter of single neurons. So exceptionally high um, spatial resolution recordings. Now, let me switch gears and talk about the opposite uh, phenomenon, how you can go from um, recording signals to triggering activity in the brain by sending in biomolecules. And this is again in the context of epilepsy. As I explained earlier, the first line of defense is anti-epileptic drugs. Um, however, 30% of the patients show drug resistance and drugs do have side effects. In cases of severe epilepsy and pharma pharmacoresistance, the next line of defense is resection of the epileptogenic zone. However, this is not always possible because this zone might uh, overlap an area of high functionality. And then the cost benefit analysis just doesn't work for this patient. In these cases, we advocate implanting a device 
in the epileptogenic zone and delivering drugs there past the blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier would prevent some very powerful drugs from getting into the brain or necessitate that drugs are given in such a high uh, 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 concentration that they have side effects. So by giving the drug past the blood-brain barrier, you have a much larger gamut that is available and you avoid side effects. This concept has been tried in, um, uh, in the case of uh, brain cancers, where after a section of tumor, you can release chemotherapy locally, either by having a, a piece of plastic that is infused with a drug and biodegrades in the brain, or by having a, a, a catheter that um, uh, supplies the drug solution locally. However, these concepts are not suitable for epilepsy for a variety of reasons. Um, and quite frankly, they don't work very well in brain cancers uh, uh, either. For example, when you deliver a drug solution, the brain is a closed system. Um, you need to apply quite a lot of pressure here that causes a lot of, a lot of damage. So we were very excited when we saw uh, about 10 years ago, a new type of device that was developed at uh, Linköping in Sweden and, and Karolinska uh, Institute that uses electrophoresis as a way to take drugs and move them from one reservoir to the other. So this, was a, this is a device that can take an ion, uh, a drug in the form of an ion, and move it through a material very similar to the ones that we make electrodes out of and then release it to a target. And this is done by electrical activation. The advantage of this technique is that it's dry. You only move the ion and not the solvent. So it's particularly suitable for applications in the brain. You do not raise the, 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 uh, the pressure at the uh, receiving end here. So the, the Swedes have used this device to uh, show that you can modulate hearing in a, in a guinea pig. And we uh, took it to the, uh, the case of neurological uh, disorder. So um, the way this device works is it has a membrane that contains fixed anionic charge um, and separates the uh, source reservoir, which is placed inside the brain and contains the solution of your drug from the target, and the target is the brain. So when you apply a potassium, then you can move your drug through the membrane and into the brain, while the fixed anionic charge on the membrane blocks current in the other direction. So ions from the brain are not able to, to come out and penetrate in your device. So you maintain the uh, concentration of ions in the brain while supplying your, your drug. Um, this is how this device looks like, and this is the preclinical version that is being tested for safety and efficacy in animal models. It contains a microfluidic channel that is U-shaped, you bring in the drug solution here. At the tip, at the part of the brain where you want to uh, uh, release your drug, you have holes in the microfluidic channel that are capped with this membrane. And when you apply a potential between the inside of the microfluidic and the brain, then drug ions will come out. And then what is rest of the depleted solution will be, uh, uh, will be come out uh, through the microfluidic channel and out of the brain. This affords exceptionally good control of the drug delivery process. So here we decided to use GABA, which is a um, innate transistor. It, it's a, it's a um, 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 neurotransmitter that is inherent in the, uh, the nervous system and it represents the break signal uh, that the brain gives to neurons to stop firing. And by applying just a very uh, small potential, half a volt, you can dramatically increase the local concentration of GABA and achieve a therapeutic effect. So when 
uh, validated in a, a preclinical model, this device shows quite uh, efficient operation. So here are some data with the device implanted but turned off. Here we kindle a seizure and then we wait a little bit and the seizure uh, manifests itself. So the presence of the device switched off doesn't have any, any effect. Here, the seizure starts and then we turn the device on and you see that the seizure disappears immediately. These spikes that you see here are an electrical artifact that we pick up with our electrodes that corresponds to the puffing of GABA outside the device. So we, we apply pulses to, small, to send small puffs of GABA into the brain and they quiet down the brain very efficiently. You can also prevent seizures with this. You can turn the device on. Um, and then when you try to elicit the seizure in this model, it just doesn't manifest itself. Um, a bit later, um, you can uh, verify that uh, seizures do get elicited when the device is off. So this was shown to both stop and prevent seizures, which is very exciting news. Of course, it's in an animal model. And we're now in the process of transitioning this to, to, to the clinic, which is a long, long process. Finally, um, we are working with this device to deliver chemotherapy in uh, non-resectable tumors. Um, and the challenge here is to address very large volumes. In epilepsy, you need to act fairly locally. Here, you have to address centimeter scale uh, volumes. And we were able with uh, generous funding from the EPSRC um, to mature this technology to the point where uh, we can address fairly large volumes in an in vitro uh, model. So this is again on its way to clinical translation. Now, the last few slides I want to show is on bridging the gap between uh, biology and electronics in terms of the dynamic versus static aspect of the, uh, of the two worlds. And um, we envision devices that change shape and maybe move also inside the, the uh, body as a first uh, take on this problem. Um, the motivation comes from the fact that uh, the placement of implants requires very highly invasive surgery. So to place these cortical arrays that are used for brain exploration, you will need to do a craniotomy, remove a large part of the skull, and then cut the dura in order to insert those in, in uh, contact with the brain. Um, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be nice to have only a small burr hole on the skull and then put in a device in the form of a needle and be able to deploy it under the dura without having to remove such a, a, a large part of the skull? The same argument holds for implantation of electrodes in the spinal cord. Normally, a laminectomy is required to open enough space to place uh, a paddle electrode. Um, wouldn't it be nice to do this with a spinal tap procedure, um, which is considerably less invasive? So we started exploring the interface with a field of so-called soft robotics that uses microfluidics as a way to actuate motion in implants. So here we make thin, flexible implants with electronics and also with microfluidic channels that can undergo different motions. For example, are rolling in one dimension to, uh, to, to move forward or um, are rolling laterally to expand uh, from a needle shape to a paddle shape. This is shown here. This is a spinal cord implant that can be rolled uh, into uh, a, a, a cylinder and then placed into a needle and then implanted uh, in, in the spinal cord and then deployed into a puddle. And this is shown here in an animal model, how this can be in the form of a needle and then open up. Um, we use markers to indicate the position of this implants when they're uh, implanted in human cadavers. So here, um, uh, the implant is uh, uh, just placed uh, in the spinal cord of a cadaver. And then later on, it begins to expand. You see these two uh, uh, markers uh, depicting the side, the two edges of the implant uh, spacing away from each other. Uh, this is video 
that shows a similar uh, uh, deployment in the brain. Here, again, these two markers show the edge of the implant, uh, and they deploy over uh, two centimeters. And this is an implant that was placed in through a small burr hole um, and would otherwise require a fairly massive craniotomy to, to, to put in the brain. So I'd like to, to stop here. And I hope I convince you that implantable electronics in what today is called bioelectronic medicine hold considerable promise, not only for understanding the brain, but also for addressing uh, neurological disease. Materials that are called mixed conductors uh, enable higher resolution recordings from the cortex without penetrating the brain and can record neurons, single neurons, without penetrating into the brain, which is a, a, a wonderful new capability that has now found its way to the clinic. Uh, I showed you electrophoretic devices that can uh, deliver the drug without the solvent and have excellent spatiotemporal uh, resolution in the drug delivery process. And this allows us to stop and prevent seizures in an animal model. And these are now considered for clinical translation for the cases of epilepsy, but also for addressing uh, non-resectable brain tumors. Finally, microfluidics allow expandable implants that minimize the uh, invasiveness of neurosurgery. This was shown in uh, cadavers and it's um, I would say about uh, two years to uh, subclinical work. So with that, let me thank my group uh, collaborators in Cambridge and outside and uh, funding agencies who have generously uh, uh, funded this work. So with that, I will stop and uh, take your questions. Um, please post them in the Q&A. I see quite a few uh, uh, questions already, um, and we'll try to address as many as possible. I will leave the slides on if there are questions that require to go back to slides. Um, it's good to have them handy. So the first question from uh, uh, Martin, in the UK, how severe does dystonia need to be before DBS is available through the NHS? Um, I do not know how to answer this, this question. Um, this would be um, a, a neurologist that would, uh, a consultant who would, uh, um, who would tell you that. Um, I do not have a medical uh, training. Um, the, 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 the second question from uh, Garth, is there any scope for treatment of uh, MND? Um, MND. Uh, I'm not sure what MND stands for, to be honest. Um, would you be able to clarify, please? Then I'll come back to this uh, question. Um, will you cover um, TMS? Um, and again, uh, TMS would be transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, often, Three-letter acronyms uh, mean different things to different people. And uh, I, I found as an engineer, uh, it means something different to a medic and something very different to me. If this is transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation, I will not uh, because we, we do not work in this area. It's a very promising technique, but not something that, uh, that we do in, uh, in my lab. Um, is there a scope for nanoparticles to penetrate the blood-brain barrier? Uh, in a way that can be used therapeutically. Yes, absolutely. This is a big area of research. Um, we work with a group of David Ferren Jimenez and with a group of Liliana Fruk who make nanoparticles that can encapsulate massive, massive quantities of drug. These are called metal organic frameworks and they're a bit like Legos. They form cages that can uh, enclose quite a lot of drug. And on their periphery, you can use moieties that allow you to go through the blood-brain barrier and also that allow you to image them as they go uh, through the body. Um, this is in the, concept, in the context of uh, uh, cancer. Um, David's and Liliana's group work very closely with uh, Duncan Jodrell, who's a clinician interested in pancreatic cancer. 
as well as with uh, Stefan uh, Marciniak, who's a clinician uh, interested in uh, mesothelioma in order to address this uh, conditions. And this is within the EPSRC funded research center that I mentioned earlier. Uh, does your work offer any scope to understand the mechanism of epilepsy? Yes, this is, I didn't talk much about uh, uh, this today, but we are looking into the interplay between metabolic activity and electrophysiology. Uh, typically, there are two uh, schools of thought. One that is looking at the whole brain um, using imaging, uh, MRI, for example to try and understand uh, uh, changes in metabolic activity that are so associated with uh, uh, different conditions. And then you have the electrophysiologists who just stick electrodes in the brain and try to understand the chatter of neurons. And these two communities don't communicate uh, very well. They work on different spatiotemporal scales uh, as well. What we try to do is to make metabolic sensors that are very small and very fast and can be implanted right next to uh, electrodes that measure electrophysiological activity. Um, so we try to understand what happens locally in the neighborhood of a small uh, neural circuit uh, before, during, and after a seizure. And the interesting thing that we found is that uh, lactate, for example, trends a few seconds before uh, a seizure is manifested on the um, electroencephalogram. Uh, the uh, electrical recording in the same area as the, uh, the, the, the biosensor would lag by a few seconds, showing that probably it's the metabolic activity that, that uh, goes down, eliciting the seizure as opposed to uh, the other way around. Um, this is still under investigation, but the interesting thing is you can use this. You can use a metabolic sensor to trigger the ion pump to start delivering GABA uh, and then stop the seizure. So five seconds of warning is plenty to trigger evasive action. Um, another question, uh, you mentioned silicon, assuming germanium has the same problems. Yes. Uh, uh, Typical inorganic semiconductors will have the, the same uh, issues. They, they would not be very friendly to ions. Um, and as a result, they would not give you very good coupling between ionics and electronics. Uh, Mohammed, as a, a psychiatrist, I'm interested whether there are applications to electronics on the brain in treating mental disorders but also further in modulating human behavior and psychology. Please, could you comment? Yes, this is the, the, the uh, next frontier, is uh, neuropsychiatric disorders um, and the use of uh, brain stimulation to address those. Um, I don't work on this directly. Uh, uh, I, I've just read some of the literature. I find it very fascinating. Um, one thing that I found really fascinating is um, people consider the ethics of the implants. Um, medical ethics, of course, is a, is, a, is a big field, but when you put an implant in the organ that generates the sense of self, um, you bring it to another level, right? There are questions of agency, questions of um, that are very important. So there were uh, people who were implanted for obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, no, sorry, people who were implanted uh, with a DBS for Parkinson's and became compulsive gamblers. And they were able to only understand the impact that this had on their family when the implant was switched off. So. To me, this is fascinating because it, um, it obviously raises uh, uh, fascinating issues. Um, how do we understand uh, this? Uh, how do we understand ourselves when we have a machine that uh, acts on the, on the brain? 
Um, there is a lot of work uh, to be done here. It is definitely a frontier that is very exciting. And I will leave it uh, at that. Um, Capastans quoted seem extremely high. Um, yes, they are. Um, so a typical uh, capacitor in a dielectric is orders of magnitude lower. So we're talking about nanofarad per uh, square centimeter for a typical capacitor of, um, you know, 100 nanometers of silicon oxide. Um, and here we're talking about hundreds of microfarads. Yes, they're, they're very large. And it has to do with the fact that when you work in electrolytes, the spacing between the two plates, let's say if you have a double layer capacitance, you have a metal uh, plate and then ions sitting on top of it. So the, uh, the space between the, the, what would be the two plates of the capacitor um, would be in the nanometer range. And that accounts for the very large capacitance. Oh, motor neuron disease, MND. Yes, thank you for this uh, clarification. Yes, yeah, so um, motor neuron uh, disorders are indeed um, um, targeted with, uh, uh, with uh, um, the brain st uh, stimulation. Yes, um, indeed. Um, I do not know what is the, uh, the current uh, state of treatment within the uh, NHS. Uh, but uh, from what I see in research, yes, it is a, a, a has been a target for uh, uh, the brain stimulation. Um, and thank you very much for the clarification. Let me see. Uh, yes, thank you. Do you foresee any potential application of this technology for stimulating regeneration or spinal cord injury? Yes, this is something that. Uh, goes back uh, a long way and there have been recent breakthroughs. So uh, the idea was, can you stimulate um, re innervation across an injury? Um, a couple of years ago, there was uh, people would think, would believe that uh, it's, uh, there is a limit uh, if the injury is above uh, a particular length, then that would not be possible. Today, there are people who use biomaterials to fill the gap and enhance uh, by giving chemical and mechanical cues, enhance this uh, uh, regrowth and combination with electrical stimulation has been shown to have major uh, beneficial effects. There was a paper, I think, uh, last year or uh, two years ago by uh, I believe a scientist at EPFL that explored this uh, phenomenon and showed uh, quite significant impact in uh, patients with uh, spinal cord injury. So again, this is in the domain of active research, very exciting. Uh, and I expect there will be rapid developments in the next uh, five years. Um, let me see, is there any hold on, uh, possible application of nanorobots and soft robots in surgical procedures? Yes, surgical robots is a, a, a big thing. People use surgical robots today to operate either very delicately or remotely. Um, the interface between the field of robotics, in particular soft robotics and bioelectronics is very promising. Um, you can envision implants that would self implant where a little device you would nudge it into the brain and then it would go, it would crawl in and find the optimal location to stimulate. And then uh, a couple of years later, it would move to another location. Um, there was a very funny story. There was a, a, a story on CNN uh, a couple of years ago that inspired me to look into that. Um, there was someone who managed to collect a, a parasite, a, a worm, um, living in his brain for several years and um, would give him the occasional uh, uh, headache. Uh, but other than that, um, 
didn't seem to bother him too much. Um, and the size of the brain was, the, sorry, the size of the worm was quite large. So that is inspiring to someone who does soft robotics. I was talking to a, a, a colleague uh, who does that, saying that, oh, we can easily make soft robots that size. Um, and if they can move in the brain in a, in a fashion that doesn't cause uh, too many side effects, then you can envision having electronics on them and making little devices that could uh, uh, dramatically decrease uh, surgical uh, burden. For example, uh, today you have to implant along a straight path and um, being able to implant along a non-straight trajectory uh, would definitely lead to non uh, or much less invasive procedures in, in several cases. Uh, are you aware of any research that uses exosomes to cross the blood-brain barrier? And maybe this could be pumped in with your devices. Uh, that, that is very, very interesting. Yes, um, uh, exosomes and, and other particles uh, are being used to uh, or liposomes uh, more traditionally to, to cross the blood-brain barrier. Again, Liliana Fruk is, a, is an expert here in chemical engineering. Um, whether we can pump such large structures with the ion pumps is, um, there is a big question mark there. Um, what makes the ion pump uh, work well is the fact that we have a membrane that blocks the uh, opposite uh, species, the counter ion. If we're pumping a cationic drug, it blocks anions from leaving the brain and going into your device. Um, if you want to pump now some larger drugs, for example, exosomes or nanoparticles that are uh, loaded with a drug, um, you would have to start opening porosity on the membrane. And as a result, you'll start losing this unidirectionality. Uh, anions from the brain will start going into your device. When you're treating a brain tumor, that wouldn't be much of a problem, I expect. When you're uh, developing a device for epilepsy, for a chronic implantation, uh, I assume that that would not be uh, translatable to the clinic. Um, but again, it's, we haven't yet demonstrated that we can pump such large things uh, efficiently. Now, is there much work from the perspective of cybernetics and systems theory? Yes, absolutely, there is a, a big interface with all that with um, also with machine learning. Um, th there is a trade-off, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the more invasive you get, the better um, spatial resolution you get and the closer you are to the source of signal. In a brain computer interface uh, uh, configuration where you use recorded neural signals, to drive an exoskeleton, a prosthetic arm, the closer you are to the brain, the, in, the, the more inside you go, um, the more articulate the interface could be. That has been the dogma. Um, however, by uh, pulling out of the brain and looking at more complex signals, signals that correspond to, for example, volition, as opposed to signals that correspond to moving a particular muscle, um, and using then uh, uh, machine learning and, and better design of systems, you can train a robotic arm to, uh, to interpret volition and then execute the motion um, being articulate by itself. So learning to be articulate, not guided by individual signals that correspond to neurons that would drive individual muscles uh, in, in, a, in a hand. Um, so that's something that, again, is in the realm of uh, current research. Um, I favor very much that, that point of view that by being less invasive and looking at higher order activities, and then using more intelligence in the uh, prosthesis, I think it's a good way to go. 
Uh, is there any use of advanced meditation techniques in relationship to, to uh, your work? Um, uh, no, uh, not at this uh, point. But there are a lot of people who are um, using uh, bioelectronics to look at uh, people meditating, to look at uh, brain states and try to understand how the brain works. So that, that's definitely very interesting and it's in the realm of um, um, neuroscience um, and exploring the brain. Um, how widely has the single neural recording been adopted in research in other lab settings? There are quite a few groups who, uh, so in, in the lab setting, there are lots of people who look at single neurons. Um, in the clinic, um, the, the cortical technology that uh, we developed has been adopted by uh, uh, quite a few clinical groups that are now looking uh, at the brain with uh, single neural resolution without penetrating it. Um, one of our drugs um, can also cause compulsive uh, uh, gambling. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised by that. It's, uh, to me, the, the idea that you find a molecule that acts on just one out of the uh, million, billion different pathways that uh, take place in our body, it's, uh, it's extremely uh, surprising. Um, I, I find the, the specificity of drugs to be uh, uh, exceptionally puzzling. Um, now, what would happen to the expandable implants after they're used? Yes, so um, depending on the, uh, the, the, the condition you're trying to, uh, to address, in some cases they would stay in, for example, spinal cord stimulation for pain. In some cases, they would be collapsed and removed, for example, uh, uh, an electrode that goes into the brain to explore the brain and then uh, uh, in that case you would remove it after maybe two weeks for the case of exploring the brain for epilepsy. Um, are there any UK hospitals uh, to record single neural finding from the cortex? No, I mentioned US hospitals. The translation of this project took place in the, in the US. Um, it is now, uh, the next stage would be through a European uh, consortium um, in a hospital in France is the, um, uh, the next implantation of this technology. And um, we are also uh, in discussion with hospitals in the, in the UK. It, it takes a very long time for a technology to be uh, adopted in the clinic. Um, what are the long-term implications preventing EEG from matching the performance of ECOG. Well, EEG is actually very hard to make match uh, ECOG because you are in a human, you are centimeters away from the source of neurons, uh, the, the source of signals with uh, a scalp electron. While an ECOG, um, in the human, a subdural ECOG, you are uh, hundreds of microns away. Um, so it's just the, the gap is a bit too, uh, too large to bridge. I, I would not expect EEG to be able to look at single neuron activity. Uh, you would need to make the electrodes very small um, and, and, and still you're, you're way too far away. But then again, this is what people talk, uh, uh, said about ECOG, uh, who knows, maybe in uh, a couple of years, I'll be proven uh, wrong. Um, I think that's it. We made it to the end of the list. 